Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. My name is Adam Payne, Sheboygan County Administrator and co-host of this program with Chairman Mike Vandersteen. And today we're very pleased to have two of the most powerful men from the Health and Human Services Department with us. Our Health and Human Services Director, Tom Egerbrecht, and our Public Health Manager, Dale Hippensteel. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you, Adam. Good to have you both here. As you know, every month we try to bring a different department program to you to learn more about the roles and responsibilities of county government. And next month we're going to have Sheboygan County Government's Work, Works Week, which really follows a national program where we're trying to raise greater awareness about the important roles and responsibilities of county government. And these two gentlemen are going to be taking a lead role with that for Sheboygan County this year because we want to focus on the the very critical programs and services in our Health and Human Services Department, particularly promotion prevention uh, opportunities. So Tom, I'd like to start with you. Uh, please talk a little bit about the health promotion and prevention programs that you have in the Health and Human Services Department. Sure, and again, thanks for uh, allowing us the opportunity, Adam. Uh, we've talked on the show previously about a lot of the safety net services that our department is involved in. Um, a lot of times uh, prevention and promotion flies under the radar. So indeed, we've got a $31 million budget for operating divisions and 180 excellent staff. And they are involved in a variety of early intervention, prevention and health promotion activities. And those really uh, reach over the lifespan. So on the front end, we offer prenatal care coordination uh, assistance in the area of maternal and child health, the birth to three early intervention program. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the Aging and Disability Resource Center previously, and those programs are pretty well known. And in the middle are a variety of activities, including access to health insurance. Uh, we've got community health uh, promotion uh, by way of our immunization clinics, environmental health that looks at food and water source safety. And I'm happy to have Dale with me today because we're actually involved in a variety of uh, community coalitions uh, and planning in the area of health promotion as well. And that's one of the things that's really impressed me about the Health and Human Services Department in particular is such a broad degree of programs and services, as you said, critical safety net services, but we also have these prevention programs and outreach programs that the participation from the public has been fantastic. A lot of support, lots of volunteers. Uh, Dale, talk about some of these coalitions a little bit. What's in play? Well, I appreciate that, Adam. Um, I, I think uh, people need to understand that uh, the, the public health has evolved, Health and Human Services has evolved from that place you would stop and get your immunization or that place you might stop to get a, a, uh, uh, some kind of counseling service, and then you go about your business uh, you may have some maternal and child health uh, visits, those kinds of things. Certainly some, some old-fashioned public health interventions take place every day. But what we've evolved into is a, a group of folks through lots of training, lots of changing of, of paradigms to try to bring the community together to solve problems. We as, as a, a division, as a department, as a county have a very difficult time doing that. I mean, we, we've sort of lived in these silos. And, I'll just mention a, a handful of um, coalitions that we're involved with. Sometimes we take a lead role, sometimes we share lead roles. Our Healthy Sheboygan County Group 2020 uh, is a, a, a wonderful group of folks that some people I work with um, co-chair. We have representatives from both the hospitals, St. Nicholas and Aurora. Uh, we have people from different nonprofit organizations and, and more importantly, we try to have people at large, people out in the community that can give us feedback and say, no, we're not sure why you're doing that. That's really not working for us. So that's a really good uh, coalition to, to respond to because they have very specific responsibilities of looking at community health improvement plans. Uh, one of the things that we're, that we're really excited about is a very aggressive immunization coalition that Diane Liebenthal, uh, one of my supervi our supervisors, is working with, again, hospitals, the clinics, the schools, trying to keep uh, immunization rates in children and in some adult populations as high as we possibly can because we know that's a scientifically based way to prevent disease. As Tom mentioned, prevention is really important to us. Uh, there's also a coalition 
that was driven by activities from United Way, and I know Adam, you've been involved with the United Way recently, uh, called our Community Health Center Coalition. And this is a group of folks, again, from many of the same partners, but also the community from the private sector that are looking at access to uh, health care, uh, particularly dental health care for underserved folks. Uh, we actually have a small clinic that we just started uh, in cooperation with Manitowoc County and a, a grant that we received with uh, our friends in Manitowoc County. And we're very excited about those activities because they really provide access for people with no insurance or or, or Medicaid, uh, different Medicaid uh, models to access uh, a, a higher level of service. So um, we're, we're excited about that. And, and these are great partners. Had a, had a meeting this morning with some folks out of Milwaukee and they were just quite surprised that we are able to sit with our hospital partners on a daily basis uh, in the same room and everyone's civil, you know, because they are so competitive. But uh, so yeah, a lot, a lot of activities like that, Adam, that we're, we're excited about. A lot of activities, and again, I don't think most people recognize that it isn't a few county staff rubbing their hands together in an office deciding what we're going to focus on or where the needs are. You're, you're truly working with the community as per partners, engaging them, getting their ideas, determining priorities. So if someone's watching this program and they're thinking, geez, I, there's a lot going on at the Health and Human Services Department, I'd like to get involved or I'd like to help how do they reach out and become a member of this coalition? How do, how do they offer that assistance? Tom, me, whoever? Go ahead. Uh, well, we're always looking for members. In fact, a, a, a sign of a good coalition is that there's always change in membership, that you're finding people with different skill sets, people with different interests, willing to sit on these boards and these, and these committees. And I, I would suggest that if people have an interest in any of these, these kind of issues and would like to know more about different coalitions, they should, they should call our office, stop in. Of course, now everything's email. Send an email through the, the county website, and we'd be happy to talk to them and let them know what we're up to. Excellent. And the last question before I turn it over to Mike. Need. The needs out there are so great, and it's my impression that demands for services are only going up, not down. But what are some of the trends with these particular planning coalitions that you mentioned here? What are some of the greatest needs that you're seeing in the community? Well, from a pure health perspective, or primary health care perspective, both uh, our Healthy 2020 group and St. Nicholas Hospital and the, and the Aurora System, who does a very extensive survey in our community, uh, which they do in all the communities they serve, um, the, the, one num the number one issue is access to dental care, just basic primary dental care and prevention uh, for folks in the Medicaid population and people that have no insurance. That has floated to the top, of, you know, and we all sort of have our biases, but I think, uh, Tom, we've, we've seen that through our, through our uh, groups. And, you know, you can have a lot of things wrong, but if you have bad dental health, it, it has such a negative effect on your overall mental and physical health that right. this has risen to the top. And we're getting wonderful cooperation from many of our, our dental community folks. So Outstanding, outstanding. Thank you. Mike. Tom, earlier you mentioned the uh, Birth to Three program and other early intervention programs. Can you tell us a little bit about how the Birth to Three program really benefits the families mm -hmm. in Sheboygan County? Sure. Uh, one thing that uh, science has uh, told us, Mike, is that development in those first three years of life is critical. In the first 12 months, for example, a baby's brain doubles in size in the first three years of life. Brain activity is about double that of what it will be in later life. So that first three years offers critical opportunities to promote development and those windows of opportunity close after the first three years. And we also know that the role of families and caregivers in promoting development during that early stage is critically important. So we offer a program called Birth to Three. I'm pleased to say that it's open to all county families. It's not an income-based program. Uh, it takes a look at the development of children, those who may be experiencing developmental challenges, who may have diagnosed conditions that could result in some form of delay, or have atypical development, or just questions in general about how a child is developing uh, can request screening through the Birth to Three program. So once children are found eligible, 
uh, I'm pleased to say, and it's in alignment with uh, a little bit of what Dale was talking about. Historically, our approach to serving children in that circumstance may have been what I'll call a traditional medical model. We would have focused service uh, in the interest of that child. We would have held the child as the center point of our uh, efforts. But this Birth to Three program engages families. It's a home-based program, and it understands that if we're going to best promote children's development long term, then we should focus our efforts on educating families on how to promote that development. So once children are enrolled in the program, it's a home-based delivery system. Families may be called upon to cost share if their income is high enough. We'll ask for access to health insurance if health insurance is available. And um, once that's all in place, we work with a number of community partners. We work with the Rehabilitation Center of Sheboygan, and they provide us with educators and service coordination assistance. We work with an agency called Rehab Resources that provides therapists, speech therapists, occupational therapists, physical therapists, and all of those professionals will do home-based instruction and intervention, again, engaging with families uh, to teach them how to best support those children. Last year, we served just over 300 children and families in that program. Sounds like that's a big help. Mm -hmm. Now, Dale, uh, what about maternal child health and WIC programs? How are those similar, um, and um, in what areas do they really uh, help out? Well, the, the, uh, the Women's Infants and, and Children's Program, referred to commonly as WIC, uh, that is a, a nationwide program that deals with, with uh, nutrition activities, health activities, or health assessments of folks that are eligible for the program. And, and people certainly could call the office and we'd encourage them to see if, they're, if they are eligible. Um, and our staff could certainly give them detail on that. But it, it's pretty integrated. The maternal child health staff, which, do, which also do a variety of things, but they do prenatal care coordination to make sure that moms, pregnant uh, ladies, uh, younger women particularly, have access to good prenatal care, have access to these prevention programs, be sure that during their pregnancies that they um, understand good nutrition. Um, we're, we're doing a, we're working with uh, folks now on a thing called first breath, which are, gee, believe it or not, there are young people that smoke, uh, unfortunately, and there are young women that are pregnant that smoke. And we're trying to intervene and at least get them through their pregnancies without, uh, without the smoking habit, which is so deadly to those, those uh, uh, children before they're born. Um, so, it, it, you know, in, in, again, in the old days, as I would call it, in my, in my career, there were, things were categorized, things were in silos, and I was a person, or a, I, I would have a person do WIC, I'd have a person do prenatal care, I'd have a person do lead. Now when a child walks into a, the WIC clinic, as an example, they will have a health screening, they will have a, a, a lead poisoning, a blood test, they may be referred to immunizations, they'll catch them up on their immunizations, you know, we, we kind of capture them for a few minutes and we try to, to do everything we can in the preventive world, uh, pre preventive health world, to keep those moms and keep those children moving forward in a, in a good, healthy manner. Thanks for explaining those similarities. Tom, I, I know that uh, your department's also involved in helping people find access to health care. And um, what's that situation like today? Uh, what kind of assistance can you provide? Mm -hmm. And how are the demands for that coming along? Is that something we're seeing more need for? You bet, Mike. Um, that access to, to health insurance benefit is made available through our economic support division. And uh, I guess it follows that uh, in order to make use of health care, most persons need a payment source. When people don't have a payment source, they will defer health care. And what that does is it leads to uh, major illness and poorer health outcomes. So our department, through our economic support division uh, in particular, provides access to a program called Medicaid, or medical assistance, which many people are familiar with. 
And there's a couple of tracks that will allow people to gain access to that health insurance. The traditional track is related to Social Security determination on behalf of persons who are elderly, disabled, or blind. But in recent years, the state of Wisconsin also opened that Medicaid program up to working families who are either uh, underemployed or whose cost of health insurance access is not able to be met with wages alone. And that program is called Badger Care. And what we know is that our experience in Sheboygan County, that program has grown by 300 percent. The enrollment in that program has grown by 300 percent in the last 10 years. We saw a spike in 2004 when the program was opened up to working families, and that spike was about 40 percent growth at that time. I'm sorry, 50 percent growth at that time. And then in 2009, once we started to realize the full downturn of the economy and people became unemployed, program enrollment grew by another 40 percent. So you can see, you know, the, the environmental conditions that have led to the growth of that program. Currently, as of last year, we're serving about 16,000 persons per month through the medical assistance program and benefits totaling about $100 million per year are made available. And that pays for health care, prescriptions, things of that nature within Sheboygan County. That's great. Um, now, our aging population is a concern uh, more than just Sheboygan County, but how are you dealing with the people from the baby boomer generation who are trying to access health care uh, programs in Sheboygan County? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right, Mike. The, um, the aging population, and I'm glad I'm not there yet, by the way, so um, <laughs> the aging population is becoming a huge driver, if you will, for many of the programs that we offer and for health care in general. Um, I mentioned our Aging and Disability Resource Center earlier. That's a program that was established through our department's efforts about five or six years ago, if I recall correctly. And uh, the demand for that service has grown exponentially during that period of time. Last year alone, requests for assistance through the ADRC grew by 20%. We're currently receiving about 11,000 requests for help each year. And those requests range from information and assistance, benefits counseling, futures planning, and health promotion activities. Uh, one of the things we did this year, Dale and I, in, in collaboration and in uh, a partnership with our staff, is we've now assigned one of our public health nurses to a half-time position at the ADRC in the interest of health promotion. So why health promotion for older people? Well, one of the major public health concerns for folks who are older is falls. And what we know is that for persons age 65 and over, about one out of three is going to experience a fall each year. By the time you reach age 85, your likelihood of sustaining a fall grows by about four times that amount and falls lead to major injuries, lead to hospitalizations, and in some cases lead to death. So preventing falls is a major public health concern. We offer falls prevention programming through the ADRC. We offer uh, living well with chronic conditions classes through the ADRC. Uh, right here on TV8, there's a monthly independent lifestyles program. Uh, we have a senior newsletter that's actually available online for persons who may not be able to access it or are not accessing it through direct mailing currently. And we offer five senior meal sites throughout the county, and that's in Adel, Plymouth, Howard's Grove, Sheboygan Falls, Sheboygan. And so we promote nutrition but also socialization for that population, all of which lead to better health outcomes. That's great. I appreciate you expanding your programs to uh, keep up with that growing generation. With that, I'll turn it back over to Adam. Thanks, Mike. Tom, you and I had a chance to attend a meal site a number of months ago, but mm -hmm. it was for an individual, I think, celebrating our 100th birthday. That's correct. Yeah, and it was, it Pretty was, neat. It was real neat, and it mm -hmm. was nice to interact with the individuals that took advantage of that service and, and uh, 
just it was just a good day. Mm -hmm. Bernita, I think her name. I think I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. We, we had a big celebration that yeah. day. A lot of music, some laughs, some fun. And you're absolutely right. I mean, just sitting over lunch and hearing some of those life stories and comparing notes. Um, it, incredibly enjoyable for me, yeah. and I can appreciate for the folks that have come to rely upon those meal sites. That's a, a vital piece of their, their daily life. We had public hearings. Uh, we have public hearings every year related to our budget, and I would have to say that the number one, uh, you know, uh, hope that was expressed to us through our public hearings is please keep the meal programs going because people appreciate them so much. Well, speaking of meals, I know, Dale, you commonly, commonly are in the paper referring to some public health matter dealing with our restaurants or food safety, water quality. Uh, tis the season. Pretty soon folks are going to be heading back out to Lake Michigan and, and taking advantage of the, the spring and summer conditions. Share a little bit about your role there. What, why do we see you periodically commenting in the paper about water quality or food handling? Sure. Sure, Adam. Uh, it's, that's one of my favorite subjects. Uh, that, that happened to be my, my original uh, uh, public health background uh, when I uh, got out of college. We have a small unit called Environmental Health Services within Public Health and Health and Human Services. And in the old days, uh, our people would have been referred to inspectors. Uh, we try to refer to them as environmental health specialists and environmental health educators. Uh, the focus has changed. We, we have about 700 establishments ranging from every kind of restaurant in the county to uh, lodging units, to swimming pools, to spas. Um, there are a, about 20 different kinds of licenses that we, that we issue uh, with an agreement with the state to act as their agent. Uh, so I, it, it gets really, it, it's just a lot of fun. We provide surf safe courses for the restaurant managers and their owners so that they understand what they're supposed to be doing to protect the public. And in this day and age, when every time we open the paper up, we're looking at tourism, we're looking at trying to bring people to our community, not only to, for economic growth, but because we, we're proud of it, that the last thing you want to have is any significant kind of outbreak because of, of poor environmental health programming. Uh, you talk about people will soon be going to the, the lake. Um, I was, uh, uh, ha I have, we have the good fortune of living a block, or about a half a block off Lake Michigan, and last weekend, you could hardly get down Lakeshore Drive because everybody was waiting around and all the, the kite flyers on their boards were, were uh, on the south, off the south pier uh, at uh, Blue Harbor. So, you know, we, we sample all the beaches through a DNR program uh, periodically through the summer. We post those. They are on our website. And, and we mentioned, Tom mentioned the website earlier. Uh, for folks that are interested in the, in the quality of those beaches, they, they can go on the website and see uh, what's going on, whether the beach is open, whether there's any warnings, those kinds of things. We also do a, a lot of work in, in the city of Sheboygan on childhood lead poisoning because of construction, because we have a lots and lots of pre-1970 uh, housing units in the county, and we have a very active program. So, good stuff. Excellent work, a lot of very important work, and I know we had a few more questions we want to hit here yet today, but we've already uh, gone through our 30-minute program, and again, I, I can't impress upon you enough the important role and responsibilities of our Health and Human Services Department, and today was just a thimble of the very important work that they do, and if you have more questions or would like to get a better understanding of other programs and services, don't hesitate to contact either of these gentlemen or anyone at the Health and Human Services Department. We have outstanding staff highly dedicated, and they're there to help you, so don't hesitate to follow up. Again, as I mentioned at the onset, next month, Sheboygan County Government Works Week, Health and Human Services will be our fundamental focus. There's gonna be some special programming and opportunities to learn more, and again, uh, get involved. Uh, be part of this outstanding committee, and certainly we support your work, and thank you, Tom and Dale, for being here today and giving a nice overview. Thank you both. Thanks. So on behalf of the Sheboygan County Board and Chairman Mike Vandersteen, again, thank you for joining us. Next month, our Child Support Director, Jim Groff, will be here to talk about the important work of the Child Support Department. And again, until then, thanks for joining us.